Hello, everybody. Good to see you all. Everyone get my get and read, I should say, my email about the quiz, quiz number one. I see some people shaking their heads, nodding their heads. Yes, okay. okay. So just to uh, give you an update on that, yes, there is a problem on Canvas uh, that started a couple days before the quiz was due. Thankfully, I'm obsessive compulsive, so I was constantly going through like the preview and the questions to make sure it was okay. And uh, noticed that there was a formatting issue that just started out of nowhere. I don't know what the problem is. So I did go on the community board to try to find a solution, and I did find that someone else was having the same problem that ar arose at the same time. So it does seem to be a canvas issue so i uh, contacted the the learn uh, was a teaching learning and innovation department here at the university so they're aware of it hopefully they're going to make canvas aware of it and canvas will fix it but who knows who knows when canvas will fix it so i had to take it down or i didn't take it down but i unpublished unpublished the quiz and it will come back at a later date um looking into options one option that i was thinking of they do have online uh, websites where you can uh, create quizzes for free and but you know that's not too helpful so you have to like pub, uh, buy a uh, an account which is not really that expensive I might purchase an account for one of these and put the quiz on there and you would take it on the online site and then it will publish the results and then I would manually enter the results into canvas for a fee <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There's no fee, no fee involved. Um, but that's what I would do. That's That seems to be the best solution I can come up with. But I'm hoping that Canvas will resolve the issue quickly and that I can just put the quiz back out there for you. Um, I'm sorry for that, but it's out of my hands. So that's about it. Here we are in February, which is Black History Month, and I'm continuing our um, honoring of black American Catholics who are on their way to sainthood. And today I want to talk about this beautiful black woman, this beautiful black nun, Thea Bowman, who is servant of God. So she's at that beginning stage of the path to sainthood. She was born Bertha Elizabeth Bowman. Where is she born? Does it say where she was born? Oh, she was born in Mississippi. Oh, I forgot to say that before. Anyways, she was born in 1937 and died in 1990. As I just told you, she was born in Mississippi. Maybe tells you something about the experience that she had growing up. She was uh, not born into a Catholic family. She was actually Methodist, raised Methodist Christian, but at a very early age, at the age of nine, with the permission of her parents, she converted to the Roman Catholic faith and became a Roman Catholic. Also at a very early age, in her teenage years, she decided that she wanted to become a nun, which here it is. <laughs> she did. Um, she joined a convent of nuns called the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. Franciscan Sisters because they're based on the, the charism, the, uh, the gifts, I guess, spiritual gifts, you could say, of a, a medieval gentleman, St. Francis of Assisi. Maybe you've heard of him. Very holy man in his own right. Um, and they're called Sisters of Perpetual Adoration because they their, their charism, their special characteristic was adoring the blessed sacrament, you know, the bread and wine that changes into the body and blood of Christ, adoring that day and night. That's things that you do in religion, you know? <laughs> um, who knows how many sisters they have, if they can still do that, but because the numbers of sisters have kind of cratered in the last 50 years, but let's hope so. Anyway, she joined this religious order, the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. She was the, oh, God bless you, she was the only black woman in the order. Which again, you know, tells you something about the black Catholic experience, which kind of mirrors the general experience of, Cath of I should say, black people or African Americans in, in American history. Um, so anyways, nevertheless, she earned a PhD in English literature at the Catholic University of America, and she dedicated herself, she saw it as her mission to kind of celebrate and to um, put out there, where I'm looking for them, 
have a PhD. I should have. I should be able to use a better word than that. But anyways, uh, um, to put out there the Black Catholic experience. So she was um, part of creating Ms. Reeser, a hymnal of Black Catholic hymns. She's known for that, uh, amongst other things that she did, and known for being a very holy and good woman as well. She uh, died of cancer, as you can see the date in 1990. And uh, her cause, I have the, the date here of 2018, and I'm not sure if that's the, the date that she was declared servant of God or when her cause was opened. But nevertheless, her cause for sainthood was eventually opened, and she has since been declared her, her practice, of, or at least her, her, uh, her holiness has been, and goodness has been recognized, and she's been declared a servant of God. So I ask Sister Thea Bowman, servant of God, to please pray for us. Amen. Let's see if I missed anybody. No, I don't think so. Whoops. Hmm, where are we here? Find the right PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so now we start on our first religion, one of the oldest religions, or actually I'd say the oldest religion on the planet, Hinduism. <sighs> Hopefully by now you have looked at or read the chapter on Hinduism in the textbook, which will, so you already know something about it but I'll try to contribute to that. This is a picture of Indra, the goddess Indra. So for Hinduism, I mean, India, as we'll learn in a moment, India and Hinduism are directly linked, so much so that they even worship India as a goddess. So here's a, a modern picture of uh, the goddess Indra, um, who is, you see some of the symbols. You see this picture of uh, the, the four lions, which is one of the symbols of the country of India, the nation of India. So even uh, you know, India is worshipped as a goddess, is a divine figure for those who follow Hinduism. Yes, Mother India. Hinduism has, as far as we can tell, 5,000 plus years of history. And with Judaism, which will come after Hinduism, with Judaism, it is one of the most ancient of the world's living religions. It's so old that it, it's one of those religions that has no founder. We don't, there's no particular person who seems to have founded the religion that we can point back to. And Hinduism has no really official creed. There's no official statement of belief that you can go to where you can learn base, the basic beliefs of Hinduism. It's a, fair, it's a hodgepodge of beliefs. Sometimes they make sense, sometimes they're contradictory, which is what kind of makes Hinduism a very interesting religion, but it could also drive you nuts trying, trying to systematize it and bring some order to it, because um, there's no official creed. Mother India, as I just showed you that picture of Indra, the goddess, the India personified as a goddess, and that is Mother India. You come from Mother India. To be a Hindu is to be Indian, and vice versa. And so I show you the, a map of the modern country of India, right there. According to, uh, on my PowerPoint, it says there are circa one billion Hindus, um, whether practicing or not, I don't know, I mean, because there are over a billion people in India, and most of them are Hindus. But according to the Pew Research Center, which is a, a, a group that uh, does sociological research and does surveys and stuff all about politics and religion and stuff like that, and the religious stuff I find interesting, obviously, and so I find it very useful. But according to a study they did in 2015, to be more specific, there are 1.03 billion Hindus on the planet. So what is that? 1 billion, 30 million? Say 1.3 billion Hindus, to be more specific, than my PowerPoint is. 
and it's called the Pew Research Center. Most Hindus are located in India itself, as you might suppose, but also in neighboring countries like Nepal, the nation of Nepal, and the nation of Bangladesh, embedded there, India. So you'll find most Hindus in the world. And obviously there's a diaspora, you know, here in America with tons of Hindus. And my, my state of New Jersey, um, Jersey City is the place to go if you're an Indian person. That's where a lot of, there's a large Indian community in, uh, in New Jersey there. Um, I remember I visited my brother who was studying at Leicester University in the United Kingdom. And Leicester was the center point of where Indians go in England. So that's the, the, the point uh, in that country. So there, you know, there are Indians, obviously, outside of India, but most Indians are in the region of India and neighboring countries. The word Hindu actually comes from the name of a river, which, ironically enough, is no longer located in India. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like we'll, we'll learn in Christianity that Jesus Christ was born before he was born. Um, so you get these, and you can't make, I love historical details and stuff like that, because you can't make them up. So actually, the, you know, the word comes from a, a river that is not in India, even though it's used as the, the denominator for the religion, for India, um, for Hinduism, which is the religion of India and Indians. Um, in this river, you you can still, obviously, the river's still there. You can see it right here. It's in the country of Pakistan, which used to be and historically was considered part of India. But they, in the 19, it was 1940s, I think, they partitioned between the Hindu region of, uh, of the Hindu majority region of India and the Muslim majority region of India. So you got the two nation states of Pakistan, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, and then the, uh, the country of India. Okay. Um, but, you know, historically, this was part of India, so this is, this is how it works, even though today the river is no longer in India. The Indus River runs through Pakistan, okay? Indus. In Sanskrit, it's called Sindhu, which simply means the river. It's simply a word for river, okay? But it means this Indus River, okay? And as this word Sindhu became or, or came into, for example, other languages like ancient Iranian, which you can't see from Iran, it's not on the map here, unfortunately, but uh, came into uh, the Iranian language, they, uh, for some reason, the initial S became, became an H, kind of got dropped in the Iranian languages, so it became Hindu, from Sindhu it became Hindu. Um, to describe someone who dwelled, a dweller around the Indus River, those who lived on the Indus River. That's how they described the Indians. They were the people of the Indus River who lived there. And then eventually Hindu entered into other languages, and to make a long story short, entered into English as Hindu. This word Hindu... That's not how Hindus describe themselves. That's not the name they give themselves or their religion. Okay, that's what outsiders describe them as. And the word Hindu actually only comes to be generally used for those who follow the, the various types of religion that make up Hinduism. Um, was used in the 1200s AD. Let's see if I put this on the PowerPoint or no. No. It's all written on the board. In the 1200s AD, in the 13th century, the word Hindu was specifically used by Muslims by who came from Persia, again, Iran, the, the country of Iran, or, or called Persia, to distinguish their Islamic religion from the natives of India. Okay, so they wanted to separate, you know, their Hindus, the people of the Indus River, and we're Muslims, you know, those who follow the religion um, of those who have submitted to God. So they used it specifically in that religious sense to delineate their dis delineate between them and the other religious groups. So that starts in the 13th century. And it was only used in a technical religious sense by European scholars in the 1820s, in the 1820s. So the Muslims in the 13th century to delineate their social groups in the 1820s with the advent of more of a study of religion, you have Westerners who start using it specifically for religious purposes when they're, you know, um, categorizing the world religions. They want to give them names. They want to give them a tax, not taxonomy, but they want to give names, everything. This is Judaism. This is Christianity, blah, 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 blah. This is Hinduism. 
But that is not what Hindus call themselves. Hindus, Hindus, I should say, never call themselves this or their religion by that word. The term they use for what they believe in is called Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma. Let's so make sure I thought someone came in, but I'm make sure I don't miss someone. Yes. No. Okay. Oh, Ms. Bell, sir. Hello. Which literally in Sanskrit means the eternal law, the eternal law, the eternal law of what? Of reality, of what reality really is. So for Hindus, it kind of, this name kind of gives you an, an, an idea of how Hindus, and I'll, use, I'll just use this customary term of Hindus because um, it's, it's got such a, you know, a long history and people know what you mean by it. I'm not, uh, but anyways, I don't mean any offense uh, to anybody. But uh, this is what uh, Hindus, uh, it gives you a sense of how Hindus view their religion and their place in the universe, that what they believe in religiously is the eternal law of reality of how the world and the universe really are and if you ask believing hindus those who practice the religion and really believe in it uh there is no beginning to their religion their religion pre-exists the universe or it comes from the beginning of the universe as soon as the dharma was created with the beginning of the universe and as soon as dharma existed so did hinduism so it's almost in a way a claim to being the true religion which like what we learned in Catholicism's view of itself is the true religion. So Hinduism also has this kind of idea of being the true form of what reality is like, and then all other religious beliefs are subsumed under that. So Hinduism is an umbrella term. It's an umbrella term that encompasses a family of religious belief. The only thing that seems to unite Hinduism and all these various beliefs and practices that we'll learn about is its origins on the Indian subcontinent, Mother India. And so we have this statement from this man, Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, who was the second president of the Republic of India, who made this you know, short, pithy statement that Hinduism is more of a culture than a creed. It's more of the culture of India and, and the beliefs that underlie that culture than a formalized creed that everyone absolutely has to believe in. Although we will see as we move along, there are some shared beliefs, not a creed per se, I guess, or an official statement of belief, but there are some things that kind of, every Hindu kind of assumes about the way the world is, and uh, which kind of could be a creed, but there are assumptions about the way the world is that um, Hindus believe in Ms. Riza. So let's start and take a look at the history of Hinduism. Where does it begin? Well, if we go back archaeologically, we have to go back to the people who lived around the Indus River or the Sendu River. The Sendu, I should say, because that's redundancy, I guess, because Sendu means river. Um, the, what's called the Indus Valley Civilization, the earliest uh, evidence uh, for this is in around 3000 BC. Hmm, I guess I changed the dates. Huh, they're different from my dates here. Uh, which dates do I go with? Eh, whatever. Um, 3000 BC extending until 1500 BC. In the 1920s to the 1930s, there were excavations in the Punjab and Indus Valleys, so the region around this river, this Indus River, of modern-day Pakistan and the region of northern India. And these excavations uncovered apparently homogenous, which means kind of the same, the same, there was a unity to, the, to this uh, civilization, or it seemed to be the same group of people, or homogenous urban cultures, so they were living in cities, that suggested some kind of religious and political unity. And this civilization in these cities was called the Harappa culture, the Harappa culture, which they date to from around 2600 BC to 1700 BC. And it was found near the Ravi River in modern day Pakistan. I don't think the Ravi River is shown on my map. I wonder if we could find it if I looked. I'm curious. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Whoops, go the other way, Dr. Dunn. Whoops. All right, getting closer. There we go. All right, it's Pakistan. Can you see the Ravi River here? It's not named. Okay, so it's not, the river's not named. Oh, well. And they, they discovered that there was a high form of civilization that developed in this area uh, um, around well-planned cities. So Harappa is also a place, you can see it there on the PowerPoint, called Mahenjo-Daro, which was on the Indus River, also in modern-day Pakistan. And there's a picture of the excavation, in case you're curious. So that's our first evidence for, civil, uh, for civilization, archaeological evidence for civilization in the Indus Valley region. And they found some interesting things. For example, at Mahenjo-Daro, Mahenjo they found what's called the Pashupati Seal, dated to 2600 BC to 1900 BC. And on this seal, um, you see the image of a horned male figure, presumably male, I guess, uh, who is in a yogic position, seems to be a position of yoga with the feet crossed in front of him, with an erect phallus. Does he have an erect phallus? An erect penis? It's not obvious to me, but that's what it says. I'll, let, I'll go with the archaeologists then. He has more than one face. You can see he has a face pointing forwards and faces pointing to the side. So he has three faces. And he has horns. So it shows a, a what apparently or archaeologists assume, assume, because who knows? Either, I don't know the maker of this seal, neither do they. But it is assumed that this is a god shown contemplating in the yogic position who is surrounded by animals. And archaeologists have had to postulate or speculate that this, what this image is. And some think that it's an early image of the god Shiva, who is called the Lord of the Beasts. Yes, Ms. Montiel, Shiva is not that interesting, but he will become interesting later on. <laughs> Anyways, um, so he is called, so they're making this connection. Shiva, this god Shiva, which we'll learn about later, is called Lord of the Beasts. So maybe, maybe it's him. Others just think that it's a seated bull figure, horns, hence a bull, okay? But who knows? I mean, there's no name attached, so we can't know for sure, but it's suggested. Except maybe it's Shiva. Um, oh, oh, yes, because there are many faces that I pointed out to you, the three faces, one facing forward, the two to the side, looks kind of like later representations of the god Brahma, who's the creator of the universe, the creator god in Hinduism. Could it be him? Who knows? People speculate. But it is interesting. Now we come to our second period in Hindu history. After uh, the uh, Indus Valley period, we come to what is called the Vedic, the Vedic or the pre-classical period, which extends from around 1500 BC to 500 BC. And this period is marked by what's called Ms. Panic, the, <laughs> the Aryan Migration Theory. The Aryan Migration Theory. Theory. The word Aryan comes from the Sanskrit word Arya, which means noble, someone who is noble. And it was first attributed to our friend Friedrich Max Mueller. Why do we know Friedrich Max Mueller? Let's see here. Mm. Why do we know Friedrich Max Mueller, Miss Fleming? Why does his name sound familiar? What is his contribution? What is it like a, religious person? a religious person? Maybe he could have been. He could have been. He does have some connection to religion. Mr. Rosley, what do you think? Friedrich Max Mueller. 
Where have we heard his name before? I got you, Mr. Burnell. Don't know. Don't know. You have to know for the quiz. It'll be on the quiz, Mr. Uh, Clyde. It'll be on the quiz eventually. <laughs> I might just give out a take home paper for this. Maybe I'll just do that. Anyways, that's other possibilities. Friedrich Max Mueller is under cover. I got you, but Ms. Purnell had her hand up first. Go ahead, Ms. Purnell. Thank you, Ms. Purnell. He was a German scholar who taught at Oxford. He moved to England and taught at Oxford, but he was of German ethnicity, and he is considered the father of religious studies, the systematic study of religion in the 1800s. Um, and he was a linguist. He studied languages. One of the languages that he studied was Sanskrit, which is an ancient language, which is part of what's called the Indo-European language family, which includes English, it's Irish, it's German, it's Greek, um, Armenian. You know, it extends all the way from northern India to, to Ireland, across that region. Uh, and all these languages are related, and he postulated or he spec uh, he possibly before it. He theorized, I should say, based on his study of languages, that there was some kind of connection. Since there was some kind of obvious connection between all of these languages stretching from India to uh, to Western Europe, that um, you know something happened. The people speaking those languages moved around and brought the languages with them. So as he studied Sanskrit, he noticed Sanskrit was connected with languages all the way back to Europe. But he noticed that Sanskrit was not connected to what were, were seemed to be the local languages in, Idil in, in Italy, in India. So if we go back to our, we go back to our map of India, um, linguistically, if you look at India, the whole northern section has the Indo-European languages. Okay, and there are more than just Sanskrit. There are modern languages. There's Hindi. And there's all sorts of other languages, um, which are all related. They're they're all related to languages from Europe, so Indo-European. But all the languages in the south here are completely different languages. They're part of a different language family called Dravidian. If you're curious, they're clearly not related. So how is this so? How did this come about? Well, his theory was that the southern languages were the native languages of India, of the subcontinent, and that the Indo-European languages co came from colonizers or people migrating from the north down into the subcontinent, and they took over the north and pushed the native languages down to the south. As I said, his, you know, he wasn't basing this on any archaeological data or historical data, his idea was based largely on linguistic and literary considerations from a study of ancient Sanskrit texts called the Vedas. The Vedas. That on here? Which we will learn about later. But I'll write it on the board now. These ancient Hindu writings called the Vedas, which were written in Sanskrit. Other scholars picked up on his insight and, unfortunately, as it would turn out, introduced a racial element where they took the Aryans and they made them into whites, the white people who were or, or lighter skinned, one should say lighter skinned people who moved into the north and pushed out the darker skinned native Indians. So I assume this racist element. And so uh, you might have heard the word Aryan in connection to, say, like neo-Nazis or the Nazis of Germany. But they didn't come up with it, okay? Um, Friedrich Max Mueller came up with it and had no racial overtones. It was based on linguistic study. And uh, what the, German, the Germans took it because the Germans thought that their ancient origins were in the Aryans who came to colonize and dominate northern India. That's why the, how the Germans picked it up, okay? 1500 BC. Well, anyways, this migration theory, uh, 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 excuse me, this, according to the migration theory, these, this, uh, this movement of peoples happened in 2000 BC to 1500 or sometime between 2000 and 1500 BC. Oh, there we go. We got that picture. All right. Yeah. 
I should have done that before. Oh well, it doesn't matter. This is just a thing I found on the internet, which is a picture of the extent of the Indo-European language family. You can see that it extends from northern India all the way over to, well, you say Greenland. This is Greenland, and it's only in green. It's called Greenland. It just happens to be in green as the color here, but because it's, it's ruled by Denmark, okay? But actually, you can forget that about green. So all the way over to the farthest extent would be actually Iceland. Where the Vikings came and brought their language. So, from Iceland all the way over to northern India is where the Indo European language all is, with all these related languages. Scholars believe that it originated in this region, which is in now in uh, like southern Russia and parts of eastern Ukraine. Uh, these are the Caucasus Mountains here, there's a mountain range here, and uh, this is all steppe, this is all grassland. And they believe that the tribes that were living here were the ones who spoke the original Indo-European language, which then branched out into different languages. And they were the ones who migrated, you know, east and west and north, bringing their language with them, eventually to northern India. So sometime between 2000 BC and 1500 BC, Indo the tribes speaking, say 2000, excuse me, 1500 BC, tribes speaking an Indo-European language, namely Sanskrit, moved into the northern Indian subcontinent, bringing their language and their culture. And as I said, they were likely from this, this region of the world, the Caucasus Mountains. Caucasus Mountains. Whoops. No, that's right. Caucasus Mountains. Hence, Caucasian. Whites are called Caucasians. All right. The original Indo-Europeans were conceived or believed to be lighter skinned. What's the evidence for this? Mainly the Vedas, which is what Friedrich Ma where Friedrich Max Müller originally got his idea. The first reason being that the Vedas are written in Sanskrit, which is part of a language family stretching across to Europe. But also, it wasn't just language. It was the description of the religious practices and ideas in the Vedas that also gave him some proof. Because the Vedas describe a very different religious picture, which was more in line with Indo-European customs, religious customs, than those that were found later archaeologically in the Indus Valley or in later Hinduism. For example, nature worship. We find that in the writings of the Vedas, written a uh, worship of nature. The prominence of animal and fire sacrifice, especially sacrifices of horses. There is a sacred alcoholic drink called Soma, which is part of the religious rites. And there's a caste system. There, there's a structure to the society. There are people who belong to the higher structure of society, and then there are different levels of society that people belong to. So the newcomers are considered better, and they stay apart from the natives. Oh, not there yet. So you could see in the religious writings, not just in the language, but also in the practices that are described, that there were some differences. And how to explain these? Well, maybe from this foreign group that comes into the north. The idea of the Aryan invasion or the Aryan migration theory, migration is the preferred term nowadays, uh, is very much controverted, especially in India. You just have to be aware of that. People in India, seems to me as an outsider, I'm, I'm not Indian obviously, but as an outsider, um, people seem to be, a lot of people seem to be very touchy about any claim that anything could come from outside India. People like to believe that everything kind of was generated within India itself. So there's this kind of hesitancy to kind of say that there were any kind of developments that came from foreigners, from foreign influences. So the theory is much discussed and much controverted, and most archaeologists, a lot of archaeologists and Indologists, people who study India, reject it outright. They don't like the idea that anything came from outsiders. And, I mean, there are, there are challenges to the theory. For example, the archaeology does not... Um, completely solved the issue. There's either, uh, you know, archaeologists have found no evidence of a mass migration into the Indus Valley. Okay, stuff like that. 
Um, some people think that it's, it's an example of colonial prejudice from the time when India was colonized by the British, by Europeans. And so they think that there's, it's a prejudiced view, it's a Western bias that higher culture had, or some culture had to come to India and to, to raise it up to a different level. So there's that kind of, that whole kind of problem going on in the background. There are people who say that there's an overlap there, the, you know, there's an overlap of religious and social boundaries that the Vedic traditions arose through a complex process, and people would argue, well, they were already there. All the, Ve you know, the Vedas, they don't necessarily have to be imposed. Maybe they were already there, and that's what the Vedas, these religious writings in Sanskrit, are already showing. They're just uh, witnessing to religious practices that were already present, and maybe not imposed. But there are other Indologists like Michael Witzel, who teaches at Harvard and was it Ramala, and an Indian historian, Ramala Tapar. Two examples. I mean, it's not all a uniform rejection of the idea. Um, Witzel is a famous, or excuse me, it's a, a, a scholar of India and Sanskrit, and Ramala Tapar is an Indian historian who do accept that there was some kind of migration into northern India. So what can we say? We do. We can say that the idea was often used for racial and colonialist purposes, and the archaeology has been inconclusive. Excavations do not support either view. There doesn't seem to be um, uh, support for a full-scale migration or for purely indigenous development of the practices. There are indications for both. It can go either way. You can make the argument either way according to the archaeological record. What we do know is that the language and the religion of the Vedas are significantly different from what seems to have been practiced practiced in the Indus Valley region. At least what we can say is that the civilization that developed in the Indus Valley does not seem to be aware of the religious practices that are common to the Vedas. And so, for example, you have, just to give you another example, in the Vedas, you know, like chariots are mentioned. So, you know, and, and chariots were a, a development and come from, we know, come from outside India. They're not indigenous to India. They're, they're an imp they're obviously, um, the fact that the Vedas mention ch people riding around in chariots, even the gods riding around in chariots, has to be foreign. It's not native to India. We don't find chariots uh, arising in India. It seems to come from outside. The, and the chariot was not invented until 2000 BC. And the Vedas show pastoral village-like settings, people who are pastoralists. They raise farm animals and stuff like that. They're not city dwellers, like in the Harappa culture. In 2019, to bring it up to the modern, some modern developments and evidence, because we've, we've got different tools now, two genetic studies were done that uh, prove, or seem to prove, or give credence to, that there was the introduction of DNA from people of the, the grasslands of Eastern Europe. So uh, this is a little more conclusive here than what we've got. The, the DNA doesn't lie. You can trace the DNA from different groups of people on the planet, and the, the DNA from the people living in northern India seems to have connections and affinities to people from this grassland region of Europe. So maybe, we're, maybe uh, Mueller was right, or at least it, it's pointing in the direction that the Mueller's intuition based on language might actually might be true that there was some kind of uh, migration into northern India where they brought their language and their religious customs. Okay, now we move into the classical period from 500 BC to 1000 AD. During this period from around the 600s, oh, I say 600s BC. Uh, I wonder, again, that's... Uh, Around this period, the priestly class was largely in control of the religion. So it was largely a priest-based religion, offering sacrifices, sacrifices of animals and stuff like that. Um, but there were several protest movements that arose against the priestly religion that was common. Two of them would be Jainism and Buddhism. Um. 
Jainism started with, well, I shouldn't say started with because they're believed to have been predecessors, people who came before this gentleman. But, you know, Jainism is a founder religion. There are multiple founders in the religion. But one of the most famous and the last of those founders is a man called Vardamana, Vardamana, also known as Mahavira. Vardamana is his name. Mahavira is a title. Uh, I believe it means great champion if I remember correctly. And he lived sometime from 599 BC to 527 BC. And he is, uh, now the, the teachings of Jainism seem to have preceded him. He wasn't the creator of the teachings, but um, as I said, he was the last great teacher of Jainism. Um, I'm not gonna, I might, well, maybe in a later class, I might teach one class on Jainism if I get to it. But uh, basically there were, you know, Jainism's, big claim to fame is nonviolence. Okay, that's the one thing that uh, Jainism is known for, nonviolence towards any creature. Okay, so you can see how this is a response to the priestly religion, which is highly based on or gave a high level of um, emphasis on sacrifices, offering animals and sacrifice. Well, if you're committed to nonviolence, you don't kill animals, so you don't perform sacrifices. So it's kind of a rejection of that practice that was common to the Hindu religion at the time. So it was a rea reaction against that. And, and there are other beliefs about Jainism that were, were different. Um, some beliefs they share with Hinduism, but, other, but they reinterpret them in their own way. Buddhism comes from a man called Gautama Siddhartha, which we'll talk about later in the class on Buddhism, so I'm not going to get deeply into it now. I say it's complicated. I don't know why I say it's complicated, but anyways. Um, but, but one thing that Buddha, but, but there are affinities between Buddhism and Jainism. There are similarities between these two religions, and some people see, see that uh, in, there's influence there. And uh, it's and Gautama Siddhartha seems to have been a contemporary of Vardhamana. I don't know if they knew each other, but they seem to have lived, their, this time span of their li lives seem to have been contemporaneous. Both Buddhism and Jainism preach the ascetic renunciation of social ties and responsibilities. So they were kind of monastic religions, you know, people... Asceticism means spiritual exercises, so fasting, praying for long periods of time, um, doing you know, doing uh, physical practices, yoga stuff like that, in yoga positions, all those sorts of things, and renouncing the world. So you don't you know you're a monk, so you don't have a family um, and stuff like that. So there was also a rejection of the caste system, the structure of Hindu society that there were there were higher ups and then people in the middle and the people at the bottom okay no they reject all of this that you're all united in this one community okay and so there's a rejection of social ties and stuff like that or at least a modification of them but hinduism oh did i want to say that i want to mention that hmm. Well, it's not in the PowerPoint, so let's skip over that. Buddhism and Jainism reach their widest growth at this time and become less important. Why? Because Hinduism responds. It responds to these movements which are attracting followers away from Hinduism. And the response to this movement is what's called bhakti, which means devotion to a god. Well, I'll give you the definition there, devotion to a god. Literally, it just means devotion or piety, piety, um, but directed towards a god. So um, this was the response that uh, Hinduism made to this. They re-emphasized worshiping the gods and being, uh, being devoted to them as opposed to, as, a, as an answer to these two religions that were protest movements against traditional Hinduism kind of doubling down on the religion. Yes, we, the sacrifices which are offered to the gods, we reaffirm that, but we also um, recognize that we want a, a personal committed, um, a committed attachment to the gods and goddesses is necessary. So they're answering kind of a desire that you find in Jainism and Buddhism, where there's this idea of a personal commitment to your community and to the teachings. And not so much of a focus on sacri making sacrifices to gods and stuff like that. In the 1000s AD, there was a forcible suppression of Buddhism to the point that Buddhism, as a historical reality, all, for all intents and purposes, 
kind of dies out, Mr. Bowski, in India. There, Buddhism is not a significant religion on India, in India, even though it comes from India. And Jainism is a very small religion. It's about four or five million people, even though it's a very old religion. Um, so they, they're kind of, their effect on Hindu society is kind of blunted um, by, this, by uh, Hinduism's response. And if you read the textbook, this is during the, during the classical period is when they have what's called the Gupta Empire, and the emperor of the Gupta Empire uses his authority, you can read more about this in the textbook, they kind of briefly mention it, but uses his authority to uh, kind of give favor to the Hindu religion. So this also kind of eats away at any influence that Jainism and, and Buddhism can have, because he, as the leader, he, he uh, benefits the Hinduism and does not benefit these other religions. We also see that the Aryan religion of the of the Vedas, which is in many ways very different from what seems to have been the native religion, becomes Indianized. There's this conscious attempt to take the, the, the not, not reject the Vedas, they accept the Vedas as religious literature, but to kind of change them so that they're, they're, they're more Hinduized, they're more, they look more Indian um, than, uh, than foreign. So for example, the gods that are mentioned in the religious writings of the Vedas are either replaced by other local gods or they're associated with older pre-Aryan gods. So for example, um, the storm god, a god of the storm, you find storm gods in a lot of religions. Um, even Judaism, the, you know, the, the God of Israel is described as a God of the storm, um, is Rudra, this God Rudra. Uh, no, I did not. But in this period, there's this conscious effort to connect him with the God Shiva, this other God Shiva. <laughs> So you have the, the Vedic god, Rudra, but you have this pre-existing god, native god, called Shiva, and you just connect the two. So he's called Shiva Rudra, Shiva Rudra, and eventually people forget that Rudra was a, was a separate god, and now Shiva is the god of the storm. So you kind of cancel out, and, and in a way, Indianize, nativize, in a way, the Vedic religion. And I mentioned bhakti, but what, what, there's, what more can I say about bhakti but in, in its relationship to the protest religions? Um, you know, Jainism and Buddhism were fair, as I said, were monastic religions. You know, you belong to a monastic order, a group of monks, um, and you, you know, you performed your, your ascetic exercises and stuff like that. Bhakti was an appeal to the popular people. So you didn't want to get the people on board <laughs> with these other, these protest movements. So, you know, you wanted to keep the people still interested in Hinduism. It was also a reaction against the severity of these monastic religions, because as I said, asceticism is spiritual exercise. So they, the monks were very much committed to well, being severe, you know, to, to performing their chants or their yoga or whatever in the extreme, which most normal people couldn't do. So they had to be given something. So you, bhakti was a way to react against the severity of, of these religious practices. And it, also Jainism and Buddhism, to some extent, were about, seemed to be about suppressing the emotions, emotional attachments to the world, whereas bhakti was, had, was the reverse. It was emphasizing ex ecstasy and rapture, you know, the feeling of joy and devotion that you have with your God. From the 1200s until the 1700s AD, we have what is called the medieval period. We have the persecution of Buddhists. Oh, excuse me, I should mention that. Let me mention this first, getting ahead of myself. Uh, during the medieval period, we have the introduction of this new religion from outside called Islam. Islam had already, already been present on the outskirts of India. So I showed you the country of Pakistan. It should be in this region here. And already you had the presence of this religion, Islam, which comes from the Middle East, 
on the outskirts. So it was present in eastern Pakistan and the modern country of Afghanistan um, due to the military efforts that were waged after Muhammad, after Ma this man Muhammad, who, what you could consider the founder of Islam. Muslims do not, but um, if your historians of religion do, so that he founded the religion. Um, after his death, um, you have uh, this expansion of Islam, usually through armies going to the, the north and the west and the eastern regions and conquering different peoples, and then uh, sometimes imposing, sometimes they respected the local religions, but a lot of times there was you know, this enticement to accept Islam, which a lot of people did. So Islam was present already on the outskirts of the Indian, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, the Indian uh, Peninsula subcontinent. But around the 13th century, the 1200s, uh, Islam starts to make huge inroads into India. And so you have what is called the Delhi Sultanate. The Delhi Sultanate. Uh, oh, here it is right here. The Sultanate of Delhi from 1206 to 1526. The city of Delhi is here in northern India. Okay, so that was the center of the Sultanate. The word Sultan just comes from Arabic. It means a ruler or an authority figure. That's all it means. Um, the rulership of Delhi is what you could call it. But a Sultan, a Sultan is a ruler. So the Delhi Sultanate. During this period, there was the persecution of Buddhists and Hindus by the Islamic uh, overlords, rulers at the time. Which, spends, which spells the ultimate end of Buddhist influence in India. So the Hindus didn't like Buddhism because it was kind of a, a protest reaction against Hinduism or traditional Hinduism. And uh, the Muslims didn't like Buddhism either. <laughs> so, you know, finally Buddhism is kind of kicked out of India. In 1526 to 1858, which is... Uh, well, that's the end of that. Oh, yeah, there is the bottom. You have the Mughal or the Mughal Empire, which is founded in India. You see this on the map. These are the various sultanates of Delhi. It, it ebbs and flows. I mean, this is the earliest one. The Mamluks, the Mamluk uh, Muslims, this is the earliest one, um, which goes along the Ganges River basin. And then you have the, Ki uh, the Kilji, Kilji dynasty, which extends farther up. Um, this seems to have been the most successful of the Muslim empires, where a lot of India uh, is uh, under their control. And then you have finally this one in northern India in 1526. But it doesn't end there, because then you have the, uh, you have the uh, Mughal Empire in the 1500s, which extends into the 1800s, 1858. Okay, so you have the native religion, Hinduism, dominated by what are, for all intents and purposes, foreigners, people who have come from without. So again, Hinduism responds. And this is something that's, um, you know, been part of Hinduism's vitality over the many centuries, that when there is some sort of new development which seems to threaten the religion, there's a response. So Buddhism and Jainism, Hinduism responds to bhakti. In this case, Hinduism responds to Islam. So there's the emphasis, an emphasis on vegetarianism and the veneration of cows. So this is where the veneration of cows comes into play as a response to the uh, Islamic control. Um, why? Because they, uh, they want to emphasize caste purity against the Muslim onslaught, against, again, this idea of ca caste system, a structured view of society, which separates us from them. Okay, this is us, and we've got our structure as Hindus, and then there's them, so it separates us from them. We, we don't eat meat, the Muslims eat meat, so we won't eat meat. We'll emphasize vegetarianism. They will eat beef, so we will worship cows. We won't touch cows. We won't eat them. We will even worship them as a response to what the Muslims are doing. In the 1500s, here come... The Europeans, the Europeans. I mean, Europeans had known about India before this, okay? Because we we have references to India in ancient Greek writings and stuff like that. So people knew about India, um, but here you you start, you know, with you have the period of colonization where India, excuse me, Europeans start sending out boats and ships throughout the world to explore, to find, you know open trade routes, make money, all sorts of stuff. Um, and here they come. In 1510, see on the map here. Let's 
think I know where it is. I think it's there. In 1510, the Portuguese or Portuguese explorers establish a colony at Goa on the western side of India. Which was there until I believe, I think it was the 1970s when India invaded it and took it away. Oh, excuse me, 19, 1961, I have it here in my notes. Yeah, it took it away in 1961. India just invaded Goa and took it away from the Portuguese. Okay? And in this map, these colors show you where there are different possessions, different colonies on India at this time. Well, this is in 1700, actually, excuse me. Um, so you, by the time of 1700, you already had Portuguese colonies, the English were there, the French were there, the Dutch, the Dutch were there, and the Danes, the Danish, had some colonies, and you can see them around here. So, like the yellow here is a Danish colony. Usually little, you know, uh, not big colonies, but you know, little towns or cities where their, their boats could come and they could dock and they could sell things and trade with the local people. There wasn't a full-scale colonization effort until later, which happens with the British. And so we move into the next period, which is called Hindu revivalism, the 1700s until the present. So various European powers established little outposts along the coast of India where they could trade and do business with the locals. But eventually more starts to happen. And one group, the English or the British, start to take over the Indian subcontinent. They start to control it. And here you see in this picture what was called, this is a picture of that extent of their control, which came to be called the British Raj. Raj is a Sanskrit word for rule or kingship. Okay, you see, you know, it's, again, Indo-European languages are related. So you have the word rex in Latin or re in Spanish. Okay, so you can see the connections. It means a ruler or a king, right? It has the same meaning. The British Raj, the British rule of India, which extended from 1848 to 1947. Okay, the British had some outposts, but then they make agreements with local rulers, and eventually they're, they're acquiring land and taking control of territory. And a lot of territory, as you can see from this map, the Indian Empire, the British Indian Empire, um, which is in red on this map. Those, the red portions are the portions of the Indian subcontinent that were under the direct control of the British government. But not everything, okay? Because there are a variety of local kingdoms and principalities, local rulers that were allowed to exist. Now, they still had to answer to the British. The British were the powers that be. They had better weapons and they had better military. So they were still in control, um, even though they didn't maybe directly control these areas, these yellow areas, which were under the control of local rulers who answered to them, okay? But the red parts were under the direct control of the British. So here you have another period. Actually, you have a long, long period. You have the period from the 1200s until, well, the 1940s, where the local population, the Hindus, are under the, under the control of foreigners. At first they have the Muslim empires, and now they have Europeans and the British. But Hinduism again reacts, reacts against this, because with the British comes another religion called Christianity. Now, Christianity actually might have existed in Hinduism for 2,000 years by this time. There, there, are tradition, there were Christian communities that were actually very ancient. When they arrived there, we don't know. According to the legend, one of the early disciples of Jesus of Nazareth actually came to India um, in the first century AD and brought Christianity. Is that true? Maybe. Who knows? But we do know that very early on, in the very early centuries of the AD period, um, Christians somehow arrived in India and had a community there. They weren't very large, but they were there. They were there before the Europeans showed up. Um, and they were mostly located here in this district of India, this on the uh, western southern coast of India. Okay. Um, 
they probably, if you if you want to be, it, it, you know, historically accurate, they probably came from missionaries from Syria, the area of Syria, um, who came down and, and evangelized people or, or settled there. Anyway, so Christianity had been there before um, the British, but the British, now that they're in control, you get all sorts of Christian missionaries coming in, and not just even from the British, but because Portugal has establishments there, the French have outposts there, and they're Catholics, you have Catholic missionaries coming in, the British are sending Anglican or Protestant missionaries um, to India, and so you have people, they're looking for converts, they're looking for people to, to change to Christian. Again, like Buddhism, like Jainism, like Islam, it's a threat. Hinduism reacts. So it's called Hindu revivalism. It's a reaction against not just the Western colonialism, this political control, but against the kind of religious colonialism of the missionaries. So Hindu leaders reform Hindus' idea, reform Hindu ideas. So for Hinduism, worshiping idols is a big deal. Remember our readings from Baruch or Book of Wisdom, you know? Idol, idol worship is condemned, all right? It's, uh, you find it all throughout ancient religions, people worshiping figures of stone or wood or whatever as gods. Well, it's very big in Hinduism as well. Hinduism is like that. It's an ancient one of the ancient religions. They reinterpret this idea. So you're not so much worshiping the idol, the piece of stone or wood or whatever that's in the temple, but the idol is a mere representation or image of the god. It's just an image. <laughs> Just like the cross over there is an image of Jesus. You know, if you bow your head to it or something, make the sign of the cross when you see it. You're not worshiping this piece of wood that's not really Jesus on the cross. It's just an image. And they kind of take that, and that's a Christian idea. They take that idea and they apply it to Hinduism and say, the idol you see in the temple, it's not really alive. It's not really the God in the temple. It's just an image. It's just a, a symbol. Some Hindu reformers try to introduce the idea of monotheism, the belief in one god into Hinduism. Now, Hinduism has many, many gods. Some of them are believed to be the supreme god. But some, of, some Hindu reformers try to introduce the idea that there is really only one supreme god. And there's a rejection of the caste system, this structured system of society where you have people above and people below and people in the middle, and everyone kind of stays in his or her lane, you know, like you don't intermarry with people from out, outside caste and stuff like that. Some pe people in some castes won't even touch people in other castes because they're unclean. Um, all those rules and stuff, some, some reformers repudiate that. Okay, they kind of, because British society wasn't like that, you know, I mean, there was a caste, maybe an unspoken caste in British society of the time period, you know, because you had the aristocracy, you had the kings and the queens and the princes and kind of stuff like that, and you had the commoners and stuff. So there was kind of a caste system, but it wasn't as, as maybe rigid as you found in India at the time. So they try to try to change that to make it more open to respond, to respond to um, this foreign incursion. This is a statement. It's uh, it's reproduced from a book that this. Uh, I think he was a Methodist missionary, but he was a missionary in India, E. Stanley Jones, and he wrote this book called The Christ of the Indian Road. And he was talking to this gentleman here called Wijendranath Tagore, who was a great Indian thinker. I think he was a philosopher as well. And he talks about his experience of you know Christians because the British didn't treat the locals very well. You know, they didn't treat the Hindus very well. They didn't treat them in a Christian manner. And he made a response to that. He says, uh, or, or Jones reports a conversation he had with this guy. A penetrating but kindly old philosopher of India, Bharadatta, who is Tagore, pronounced this judgment as we sat in the evening talking for long hours. He thoughtfully said, Jesus is ideal and wonderful, but you Christians, you are not like him. So there was a respect for the Jesus of Christianity and his teachings that some Indian intellectuals had, but not for the people who brought the message, because they did not treat the native people very well. They treated them as second class or much lower class citizens citizens in their own land, you know, where they were from. The British were total outsiders. They didn't come from India. They came from without. They came from Great Britain. Um, but they treated the native peoples as if they were their servants. And so, he, you know, you get this part of Hindu revivalism 
is uh, to react against this and even to you to show the superiority of Hinduism to Christianity, because it can look point at the Christians and say, well, look how they treat us. They want us to convert to the teachings of Jesus, but they don't even follow the teachings of Jesus in regards to us. Jesus is the ideal, but you Christians don't follow him. Okay, where am I here? A peach pot. Yeah. Okay, so that's a short version, a run through of Indian history and Hin the, the religious history of India, some of the influences and the reactions to those influences. Now we're going to get into the, the beliefs of Hinduism and the nuts and the bolts of the religion per se. Hinduism did not have any sacred writings at first, any scriptures we could speak of. Um, and you find this with a lot of ancient religions, and in a lot of religions, okay? This is not something maybe unique to Hinduism. Uh, the revelation was passed on orally from teacher to student. Oftentimes it was sung. It was sung to the student who would memorize the songs of the teacher. But as things became more complicated and harder to memorize, you have writings develop. And as they develop, the writings are divided into two classes, which are called in Sanskrit, Shruti and Smriti. Smriti. Shruti you could kind of describe as the direct revelation from the supernatural, and Smriti is anything that's related to that direct revelation. It maybe is not given directly to a person, but it has some kind of connection to that, to Shruti, which is direct revelation. So Shruti, as you see from the definition, is the sacred and divine truth of the universe, the Dharma, which is revealed directly to ancient seers. The word in Sanskrit means what is heard, which emphasizes that oral aspect. Even though it's talking about writings, it still has that memory that the writings were originally pro were spoken. They were given orally to people. So Shruti, what is heard? What is heard? The sound of the universe. For Hinduism, the universe has a sound, a music, that if you listen for it, you can hear it. And for Hindus, it was heard by men who are called rishis. Rishis. Rishi simply means a seer, someone who sees into the, the truth of the universe. So the name for a group of ancient visionaries. And each period of time throughout history, there are different periods of time, as we'll learn, but each different period of time has its own group of rishis, of seers. So the rishis are poets and visionaries, and these are the people who wrote down the Vedic hymns and the other literature. They were inspired. They, they were, you know, what's another word for inspired? They were divinely motivated, wise men, you could say, who were able to understand the divine and the eternal knowledge, the sanatana dharma of the universe. The rishis are known for their not only for their great wisdom, but also for their great magical and supernatural abilities. You know, they could fly. the The rishis could work nature miracles. You know, control nature. But they're also and they're also known for great asceticism and like could stand on one leg for ten thousand years. <laughs> you know, do all sorts of weird things. Um, but they're also known for being angry a lot. <laughs> I don't know why that was an attribute, but yeah. You know. They had bouts, they had uh, temper tantrums. The Smriti are not. They, they, are also, they also contain the sacred and divine truths of the universe, but these are indirect revelations. And so Smriti are what is remembered. They haven't been directly heard, they're just remembrances of what is the truth of the universe. Although some of the Smriti do have a very high value in Hinduism, uh, even though they're not technically Shruti. So I guess you could say that Shruti and Smriti are kind of fluid in a way. There's some Smriti texts that are very highly venerated in Hinduism. and some, In some ways have more influence on people than some of the Shruti texts we'll learn about. <laughs> Okay, so
So those are our basic divisions. Now we'll get into the writings specifically on Thursday. So I'll end here with this and uh, say goodbye to you and God bless you all. Have a good day. Have a good day, sir. Thank you. Have a good day, sir. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Have a good day. You too, Mr. Urban. Thank you. Dennis. I just sent you the box. I just sent you the box. All right, guys, how are we doing? Good to see you. You're welcome. Oh, I'm going to turn you off, my friend. <laughs> okay.